If you have a Bible, if you would open it up to Matthew chapter 17, we're going to continue the journey. We're going to start in the last verse of chapter 16. I left it off on purpose last week because I believe it feeds into the beginning of chapter 17, and we're going to continue down through verse 21. We'll read it together. There is much to be said here in these passages because as I think about the persecuted church, the reality of the vision that they have of Christ that sustains them has got to be profound. As I was praying, the Lord just reminded me that people that are in the persecuted church are not super Christians. They're people just like us. Their circumstances are just different. And so they walk the journey of faith a little differently. And they have opportunity to see the Lord maybe manifest himself in ways that we don't necessarily have opportunity because we're not looking for it or we're not as needy, at least in our recognition. And yet, we have a God who is glorious and invites us to see that. And we're going to see that today in this passage. And so if you have your place, if you would stand, we'll read together these verses, starting in verse 28 of chapter 16. Jesus says, truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Matthew adds, six days later, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his garments became as white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three tabernacles here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And while he was still speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, and were terrified. And Jesus came to them and touched them and said, Get up, do not be afraid. Lifting their eyes, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. And his disciples asked him, Why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And he answered and said, Elijah is coming and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah already came. They did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they wished. So also the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he had spoken to them about John the Baptist. And when they came to the crowd, a man came up to Jesus, falling on his knees before him, saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and is very ill. For he often falls into the fire and often into the water. I brought him to your disciples and they could not cure him. And Jesus answered and said, You unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him here to me. Jesus rebuked him and the demon came out of him and the boy was cured at once. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not drive it out? And he said to them, because of the littleness of your faith. For truly I say to you, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible to you. But this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Will you pray with me? Father, I ask that you would speak to us through your word, and you would give us the knowledge that you are truly who you are, that we would see you high and lifted up, and that we would in our lives, see that lived out then as an expression of how we think, how we speak, and how we live. Lord, thank you that you are a God to whom we can come and declare our praise and our allegiance, and I pray that you would find us, even as we follow you, faithful. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So we just watched the video on the persecuted church, and the question that I have is, What drives someone to be willing to live and serve in those kind of hostile, unrelenting, oppressive, life-threatening conditions? And not just to hide, but to actually continue to live out a sharing 
life. I think we have a glimpse of this even here in this story, and so I think it helps us this morning. First thing I want you to see is this. We need glimpses of the dream. We need glimpses of the dream. Please put this in context. We have just left behind the get behind me Satan passage of Jesus confronting Peter. We've just gone through the passage that says, take up your cross and follow me. Jesus now is going to lead three of his disciples, that core group, up on a high mountain for the purpose of allowing them to glimpse what they're exchanging this world for. This second person of the Trinity, this exalted Christ. In doing so, he is visited by um, Moses and Elijah. As one commentator put it, their presence may have to do with any or all of the following. They were key representatives of the law and the prophets. They lived through two major periods of the Old Testament miracles. They were key messianic forerunners whose return was often expected with the advent of the Messiah. They were often believed with outside biblical kind of stories that they would never have died and they had gone directly into God's presence. Regardless, these are iconic men that now show up to meet with Jesus on the mountain. This mountain top experience lasts about a day. Luke's gospel records that the next day they went down off of the mountain. All three synoptic gospels have this story and this account in it. Peter, in that moment, though, he's up there and he's loving every bit of it. And he looks at them and maybe a little fumbly looks at Jesus and says, do you want me to build some houses? And you just, you're like, okay, what are those going to look like, Peter? There's some sticks over there. We can do something, Lord. Don't you worry. I'll make a house for you, for Moses, and for Elijah. The reality was he desired to camp right there. This was an incredible moment, and he wanted it to last. This is a picture of that tabernacling that God had for his people. And Peter, grasping at anything, said, what can we do? It's good that we're here, not necessarily because we can build you houses, but because we get to spend time in this moment. All of this happens as a fog settles in and God speaks. And he speaks the same words that he began and commissioned the ministry of his son with in his baptism. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. The exact same words. And then he tags on one little phrase. Listen to him. What an endorsement. God was pleased beforehand with his son, and now over the course of his earthly ministry, God the Father returns to speak the exact same confirming words over him. There was no mistake made here. This Jesus never fell short. He remained true where others might have failed. Where others had shown flashes of great obedience, Jesus had shown perfect obedience. And it was preparing him for a cross. Is these, are these words that God gives as a reminder to Peter, a comment back to Peter's refusal to understand or receive the hard message of the suffering Messiah? Is it a reminder before they face more intense challenges to keep their eyes and their ears open to this Christ, this forerunner? Is it a powerful mountaintop experience to set their resolve before the trial? I think that moment is all of them and more. The disciples open their eyes, the fog clears, and they are left with Christ alone. The only or the alone at the end is put there emphatically. Going forward, the disciples would have Christ and he would be sufficient for them. He was the embodiment of all that Moses and Elijah were foretelling in the Old Testament and he was commissioned and confirmed by his father above. What an incredible moment, an incredible scene. This is a moment given to show a glimpse of the glorious Messiah whom they had been called to follow wherever he was going to lead them. And what's an important gift as it served before things got very real, ultimately costing Jesus 
these disciples and their peers, many of them their own lives. They got a glimpse of the dream, of the future, of the greater picture, and it drives them forward. I believe God was gracious. He knew they needed a dream. And let's be honest, none of us like hardship, right? None of us like doing the hard things. There has to be a reason for us. There has to be dream. Dave Ramsey's live like no one else so that you can live like no one else. The idea of gazelle intensity, living a way of life so that one day you can live like no one else has opportunity because you sacrificed to see it happen. When I went to work for a financial company, they challenged me with what is the why for getting involved in this because it was going to be something outside of it. And they made me actually put together a collage of my why because they said it's going to take sacrifice if you're going to have your own business, if you're going to move yourself out of a a J-O-B into something that you feel missionally called to be doing. What is the why? Last week I was talking about running And for some of you guys, you just think I just love to run. It's a little true, but to actually get me up at 5 a.m., I really need a goal. I need a race that I'm preparing for because I know that if I run the race not ready, it's not fun. And so it gets me going. There is something that you have a a dream. You have some goal. Joey Carroll This morning ran 12 miles before he came to church. He used his extra hour well. But it's because he has bought into something. They are two-time state champions in cross country. And they've got some racing to do. And he's committed to it. And whatever that coach is telling those boys, they keep running faster and harder. And they're willing to jump and they ask how high. There's a reality in which all of us have to have something set before us that allows us to give ourselves over to the sacrifice and pain. But the question I have this morning of you is not just earthly things, but what about spiritually? Do you have a picture of what you're pursuing spiritually? Because life is going to get tough. Trials are going to come. Adversity is going to hit. Do you have a dream that drives you to keep going deeper into your faith? To following your Jesus even when it gets difficult, when it's inconvenient, when it's hard? Do you dream to experience Christ more fully, to know him so deeply and so surely that love and joy and peace become the natural position of your heart? to see his kingdom manifested in your life to your great satisfaction, whether it's in your finances, your relationships, your witness, your boldness, your resolve, your countenance. You see, Peter, James, and John, they get this moment to see the big picture, this incredible foretaste of a future reality. They were overwhelmed. They wanted more. They wanted it to last. But there was a mission yet to be completed. There was work at hand. Second thing I want you to see is this. The work isn't done on the mountain, but in the valley. Verse 9, they come down off of the mountain. And Jesus begins talking to his disciples. Jesus, again, for the last time, commands them not to tell anyone until after the resurrection. You see, the dream that Jesus has for the world cannot be shortcutted. We're not going to just skip to the end. That was the temptation in the wilderness, was it not? If you'll just bow to me, I'll give you all of this. You don't have to go through any of that. There is no Powerball jump. We must all have a dream to pursue, but to reach the goal, we must not only have a pathway, but be willing to walk it as well. Jesus knows that transfigured picture of him glorified 
is inextricably interwoven between a sacrificial lamb and a risen Lord. The Messiah in all of his fullness cannot circumvent the cross. His path to the Savior is through it. Even after the resurrection, the the disciples are asking, is it now that you're going to restore the kingdom? He says, no, not yet, still. In fact, you're to be my witnesses to the ends of the earth until that day. These disciples have the privilege of seeing this advanced view. In their questioning, though, they reveal their confusion over why it must happen. You see, they go and they ask about Elijah. And Elijah, based on Malachi, they had this idea that he was going to be a a forerunner. He was to restore all things, to bring back this state of of justice, of true worship. And so in their mind, they're going, how does a Savior suffer in that context if everything is supposed to be made right before he comes? Jesus has an answer. He affirms that the scribes' understandings of the scriptures are right. There is a forerunner. It's just that their understanding of what already happened isn't. They had the facts right, but they had drawn the wrong conclusions. Jesus clarifies in verse 12, John the Baptist, implied and understood by the disciples, has come in the spirit and ministry of Elijah, and he's done what he's supposed to do, but he was killed. And in the same way, the Messiah would suffer the same. There was work to be done. They come down the mountain and they're confronted by a crowd. Third thing I want you to see is this. Jesus longs for the dream even more than you. This next passage, this verses 14 and following are a little bit challenging. When you get to verse 17, it's really hard to say these verses positively to be encouraged by these. But in every one of the Synoptic Gospels, immediately after the transfiguration is this story of this demon-possessed, epileptic child. In Mark's Gospel, he focuses on the belief. that This is the story where the, the father says, I do believe, I do believe, help my unbelief. This is that same passage, but Matthew is focusing on a little bit different here. He leaves out that father exchange. Jesus comes and puts some really hard words. You unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him here to me. The focus is not so much on the failure of the Father as it is on the failure of the disciples. The emphasis is on the disciples' inability to cure the child. But I want you to see something. Even as he has just reminded the disciples of the imminent future path. His frustrations with sin and with shortcomings remind him of his mission to help him set his heart to the task. This is why he is here. Even more than us, Jesus longs for restoration. He longs for a restoration where we desire to see him work through us A restoration we will continue to see revealed, which is not possible without his death, burial, and resurrection. He uses terms like unbelieving and perverted, describing the generation, but lumping the disciples right back into the crowd, distancing himself. But he knows why he's come. Even with the authority handed over to the disciples to heal in precisely that manner in Matthew 8, their inability exposed their frailty They're wavering, their weak grasp on their faith. And you can sense Jesus' burden for restoration. He's not necessarily against them. He's broken for them. And in the same way, it's true for us. He is not against us. He is broken for us. And I want to challenge you in your own life. Do you understand that the Lord wants you to experience all that he has rightfully made yours? He longs for sin's hold, sin's power, sin's deceit in your life to come to an end. He wants it for us more than we want it for ourselves. 
Thursday night, I was in a Growing in Christ small group as we've been talking. We were talking about forgiveness and how we see ourselves. There are so many things that we still struggle to understand and to grasp in even areas of as simple as forgiveness and what that looks like and how it set us free through what Christ has done. And yet we are on this journey of Christ restoring and giving us greater and greater understanding of who he is and what he has accomplished so that he sees that restoration take place in us. He loves us and he has pursued us that we might see restoration. He hates sin and the effects of sin. And he continues to this day to fight against it. But his disciples didn't quite But it was a matter of faith. Last thing I want you to see is this. It isn't the size of the faith, but the size of the God behind the faith that makes the world a difference. Now, there is a last verse in here, verse 21, and I won't go into it too much, but this is probably um, a scribal ad later on. In many of your Bibles, it may be excluded or put into brackets. Um, it's a reference, um, there certainly is a reference in Mark's gospel that this come out through prayer, and I'm, I'll get to that in just a second. But the emphasis is not on what they should have been doing on their own, but to whom they should have come to have it done. The disciples have come to Jesus to understand why did we fail, what did we do wrong? And Jesus looks at him and says it's their faith. Um, I, I thought of this illustration I don't know if many of you guys have had the opportunity yet to go on a mission trip. If you have, um, there's something incredible about it. In Matthew 10, the disciples are sent on, out on their first mission trip, and they are pumped up. They were sent out with a specific charge. They expected it to bear fruit. That's why they were being sent out to the field to see a harvest. If you've ever done mission work, you're thinking, the whole reason I'm here is so that people hear about Jesus, know Jesus, and God is going to work through all of this, and we just step out in faith and we're doing incredible things because we see that God is there and we are excited to be joining him. Sadly, however, when we return to our routine, sometimes we have that focus lost. Jesus isn't necessarily around at the moment for these disciples, In fact, their strongest leaders aren't there either, the ones who would naturally be the ones stepping up. It was left to the other nine. They were down there. The question is, who was going to step up? Who was going to be that person that was going to fill the gap? Someone had to fill the role because here's a crowd pressing them saying, hey, you're Jesus' disciples. You fix it. I can imagine that they're kind of going in the back going, Figuring out who's going to be the one. And maybe stepping up, they inadvertently didn't step out in faith, but in some fleshly gumption. And their failure creates a frenzy. We can all relate to this. I think there are times where we have felt the need to step up or step out in faith. And we may have done it because we're the one that's supposed to. And so we're just going to do it. We'll fake it till we make it because we're the ones that are supposed to be doing it. Or on the flip side, we hide even more because we know there ain't no way that God's doing something through me. That's really a lot of times where we're at. We can relate to these other nine disciples. And now standing in the shadows of the mountain that Jesus has just come down off of, a place where he was transfigured before the three disciples with his great display of glory and power and the fathers speaking over them. Jesus now rebukes these disciples. Pointing to that mountain, he uses it to teach a lesson of faith. He says it's little faith. Looking at some of the commentaries on understanding this, Carson writes this, This probably does not refer to so much the littleness of their faith as to its poverty. Little faith, like a little mustard seed, can be effectual. But poor faith, like that of the disciples here, is ineffectual. 
Francis writes this, It is important to observe here that it is not the amount of faith which brings the impossible within reach, but the power of God which is available to them even in the smallest of faith. You see, Romans chapter 12 reminds us as believers that God has given to all a measure of faith. Carson goes on to write, nothing would be impossible for them. A promise that, like Philippians 4.13, is limited by context, but not by unbelief. Here it refers to the accomplishment of the work of the kingdom for which they have been given authority. You see, the downfall here was that they were treating the authority given them like it was a magic gift. As one goes on to say, a bestowed power that might work independently. In Mark, Jesus tells them that this case requires prayer, not a form or an approved right, but an entire life bathed in prayer and its concomitant faith. In Matthew, Jesus tells his disciples what is needed is not gigantic faith. Tiny faith will do, even as a mustard seed, but instead true faith, Faith that out of a deep personal trust expects God to work. You see, our faith is to be linked to Jesus. But just as Jesus had gone up the mountain and those who were left behind had tried to figure it out on their own, boy, that sounds like a story in the Old Testament, Moses going up and everybody else saying, hmm, let's make a golden calf. We are reminded that it is always Christ through us as we abide in him and him and his word in us. We can be part of great things in his kingdom, unveiling and expanding, but it's never independent of his life flowing through us to accomplish just what he desires and wills to do. It is not that God has given us, as I said to one group, a can of spinach like as if we were Popeye. That here's our faith and here's its strength. Eat it and you can do great things. No, it is more a a cord that plugs us into the source. And as long as we are connected to the source, that power flows through us. This is the invite of the disciples. The reality that Jesus sees is conflicting still in their hearts. How much are they trusting in him and walking in his power and not in just practice? couple of applications I want to give you. The first one is this. I want you to, I want to challenge if you don't have a picture of this, ask the Father for your spiritual dream. What does it look like? What are you pursuing spiritually? Are you pursuing anything spiritually? We might have dreams in this world. Oh, I want to have this career, this job, this house, this whatever, this size retirement. What is the spiritual, though, dream? What is the big picture that that gets you up in the morning seeking the Lord and his power and his strength in your life to accomplish it? Is there anything like that? What does it look like in 10 years? Is there something so motivating that you're repulsed by sin and driven into his care? And then I want to challenge you and encourage you to cast the Christ dream to others. Do you realize that you are a messenger of hope? This is not a pipe dream in the sense of a dream, but this is a reality that is offered to anyone who would receive Jesus Christ. Are you casting that dream of a a kingdom where righteousness and justice and love abound? where we are grounded in his great grace and love. Whether that's a parent to a child casting that dream, or maybe a neighbor to a neighbor, or a coworker to a coworker, a peer to a friend, a church member to a church member. What dreams are you putting before others as a testimony to the greatness of Jesus and his desired reality for life and our futures? Are you casting the dream of hope and life in Christ in the midst of struggle, adversity, and trial? And the last thing is this. Live in God-fueled faith. Wouldn't it be awesome 
that if when faith opportunities were presented to you, that you step forward not because of yourself or not because you felt like you had to, but because you were so connected to the Savior that he was pressing to work through you. You did not step forward in obligation. You did not shrink back in fear, but you stepped out in God working through you. That it was just the natural next thing in a moment of faith. That you expected God through you because you were connected to him. The disciples get an incredible picture of his glory. Do you understand that every Sunday morning we get together and we open up the word and we sit together, we sing songs together because we want another glimpse together of the, of the revelation scene where people will be around his throne praising his name. Like, this is one of those times where we get the glimpse and we're reminded, oh yeah, that's the bigger reality. That's the bigger picture. So that when those opportunities to walk in faith come, we're found faithful because we're tied to our Savior and our eyes are on Him. Would you pray with me? Father, I ask right now that you give us greater and greater glimpses of Jesus, of our Savior, of the great grace that is offered us through his sacrifice on the cross, that we understand sin to the deepest level humanly possible, that we understand your love that transcends it to the infinite degree, that we would be able to see the glorified Christ, that picture of of our Savior who has conquered hell, sin, death, the grave, who can come into any circumstance and bring hope and victory because he has already attained victory on the cross and through the resurrection. Father, give us a glimpse of the victory that we have in Christ because he is ours and we are his. Give us a reminder and a glimpse that the one who created, who spoke all things into very being, now dwells in us. Give us a moment so that we might praise you, that we might lift you up and exalt you because you alone are worthy. We have nothing to fear in this world. We have nothing that transcends or defeats you. You are great and great to be praised. Give us the eyes to see it. Give us the reasons that we can proclaim it, even over our own hearts in celebration. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Father, we come to you and we praise your name. We are so grateful that you are alive, that you have conquered all things. Father, for our brothers and sisters around the world who face persecution, may those truths be sweet today. That you have conquered those things. You've conquered their fears. You have conquered even the fear of death, the fear of persecution. God, in our lives, we may not face those same persecutions right now, but you have still taken the fears of our uncertainties, our unknowns, and you have been victorious over all of them because you reign. God, thank you for the picture of Jesus Christ that we have, for the Savior that you have given us, for a risen Lord we proclaim. In his name we depart, and we go out and live in his power. Amen.